<laughs> All right, good to see everybody this evening. We're still in Proverbs 31. We stopped last time on uh, 21. And uh, Sister Sharon, had, we talked about the snow and that she's not afraid of the snow. And Kathy and I, we talked about it a little more later on. And, you know, and uh, about the little bit of the snow, you know, and it was the time of David. I can remember we, we looked at one and, you know, uh, in his time he had one of his warriors, I believe it was, killed the lion in a snowy pit. And, you know, you could take that as just bravery. You know, as in the natural, you could say he was a mighty warrior. That would be a uh, be a mighty thing. But if you look deeper, I mean, why put a story in there, a little small scripture? It is scripture. It is Bible. That's the whole thing. It's not a Shakespeare play, you know, that you would just insert to make it more interesting. You know, that's. I think it's sometimes we preach and teach and believe when we get our people believing. Well, they, you know, we need to be like those mighty men of old, you know, one warrior that slew a lion in a snowy pit. Well, I know I preached a little bit about the lion, you know, the, you know, the voice that goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Is that a, you know, a lion over in Africa or somewhere like that, you know, on it? You, you know, you know, he's talking about Satan, talking about us, and, you know, and, you know, Jim had taught over there in Sunday school towards the end of it about, you know, the highway of holiness and no unclean beast or lion shall be upon it. Why not a tiger? You know, I mean, why why did God have them just to put a certain word where a certain word mm -hmm. or in a scripture? And you can see that if you look at it, if it would be more than just being slaying a lion in, in a snowy pit. You know, it's a time of cold. It's a time of, uh, I guess, of uh, harvest is already usually over and things like that. And it is a uh, desperate time. Uh, when we look at it spiritually, there is a uh, season of summer and winter, even in church. Okay? We say a whole lot of things. A lot of people look and say, well, their heart's all cold. You know, or they give me the cold shoulder. Well, it has nothing to do with temperature, you know. It has nothing to do with that. It has with all to do with attitudes and all those things. And that great warrior still was able to defeat Satan or, you know, the, those things that was coming against him and his enemy in the time, uh, you know, of the snow in a pit, you know. And... Uh, we always hear talk about people growing up, you know, our children, and they'll say, well, his stomach's a bottomless pit. He's like an eagle lot, you know. But the Word of God says there's a bottomless pit. You know, there's no end to sin, you know. And that pit, when it was in a snowy pit, you know, it seemed like there was going to be no end to the battle and to the enemy. But he slew it. He slew his, that enemy, you know, that lion and so on like that. So she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. You know, that uh, blood soaked, you know, and that Tim brought up about the, the uh, garment and we talked about those things. Uh, so I wonder, anybody have anything, a uh, question or anything since we've been here last uh, meeting time uh, about anything before we get particularly started into our study this evening? That maybe happened on Sunday or this week or whatever it might be that you'd like to discuss. Well, I had a, a thought about that same verse uh, where he said, uh, Her household are clothed with scarlet. And uh, so you said that was the bloodline. For some reason, last week I happened to think about one time you were talking about Christ when he got mad in the temple, he run the people out. Mm -hmm. He, I think you said he run them out with a cord. He cord, yeah, the is, cord. Is that in the same representation? Because I've happened to think about the cord and also whenever uh, I, I forget the harlot that let down the cord. Scarlet thread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She is let the 
the same thing. Scarlet thread would be the same thing as here. Now I think the cord I think that he had that he drove them out was uh, to to a point. In other words, he drove them out because they were making the. He said this ought to be a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of thieves. I think it was showing the power of God, not particularly as uh, say a covering for the sin because he drove them out. He was showing a difference between the power of God to get rid, to move out. See, it's not that they, uh, in other words, they were using uh, a, a sacred place and making it just like the world. And so he planted a cord or whatever and drove them out with it. And I think that that is showing the chastisement of God, not as particularly. I think the scarlet, uh, you know, is is more on the thing of that we are covered with it, and you've got the forgiveness because it is by the blood. Now it's not that you, we, we could say, well, you you know, well, did Christ not want them to be saved because he was angry? But he said, be angry and sin not. You know, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. So, you know, God is going to be angry. Uh, you know, we say, well, is God angry today? Uh, I think uh, God, you know, we don't know um, how he is, uh, what would we just say? He's not as us. He's not as men. Uh, we could, the closest we could come to it and describe is say uh, what is his thoughts or attitude or his emotion uh, for us, let's say, particularly in this day with our nation with our world and I think uh, God is uh, angry he said because this is scripture God is angry with the wicked every day every day, every day. so we see but it's coming to a point that where we are rejecting that scarlet line that thread that covering the blood and I think that when we we have reached the point so what reference do we have we have as it was in the days of Noah. There was in the beginning a time and a point that God said enough is enough. And they stirred up God's anger. And he said, I, you know, he said, I know what I'll do. I'll destroy man from the face of this earth. But God, I'll show one just to see within that story as he was having it written down that Noah found what? God's unmerited love. Grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of God and he obeyed because of you know that he seen probably the anger of God and knew the anger of God and things and and those things you know we look at it maybe in the beginning that there was no religion you know in the beginning but there was all kinds of religion everywhere as it is today and there's many people worshiping Christ, like I say, here's ours Christ and there's Christ and so and we're worship we're trying to worship God in the name of Christ. But I'm afraid that a lot of us is not getting it right. You know. And we've not been getting it right for a long time. And it's what brings to the fi grand finale of the end of the wrath of God, as in uh, what uh, uh, Second Peter chapter three, I guess, in that that the day of the Lord shall come on which the heavens shall be on fire and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. And because it, I think that's when the ultimate anger of God has come to this world. That's sort of, you know, he only shown a bit of the wrath of God because Jesus was God. He came in the form of man, but he was still God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So he came to show that there is a punishment for doing wrong and to the chastisement to help, help us get right and stay right, to bring us to, I think that God chastises, say, a nation or an individual, but I think God in, in the past and, and, and not too awful distant past of our nation, that God will come and chastise us as a whole people and to try to get us to start going, hey, you ought to be going back to church you know what I mean? And as individuals, it comes down to individual, but he does it as a whole, as a nation sometimes, or as a community, and families, and so on like that, or a church, you know, that it, the chastisement comes. And uh, 
that we could get them this clothing get with this uh, and within the church. Let's look see because we have to remember what this chapter is about. It is about the uh, virtuous woman, which is the church, and she is not afraid of the snow for her household and for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She's not afraid of the cold, of the wickedness. Just look at all the things that's going on. Since we've met, think of all of the wickedness, you know, the disaster things that all over the world, not just in the United States, but all the floods that's going on in people's lives, there's, you know, all over the place. If you want to look into it, and you can see, and she's not afraid of all that. And we, that's what we need to teach within our church, wherever we go, no matter within the church, because the church is just not here. It's in our household. It's it's the, uh, the building up the road or down the road, if you want to have, or the assembly. So we, our purpose, wherever we go, uh, I know Tim's an evangelist, just like I am, and wherever we go to evangelize, to preach, and to teach. It is that we, we need to be able to show the audience or God's children and the people there. You've got some that's coming that are lost and don't understand. Then you've got those that are of the household of faith that may be weak and stuff like that. But we need to see that we have that strength that we're not afraid of everything that's going on in the world. You know, I mean, there's enough fear going on now. And fear hath torments. Fear's got torment. That's the word of God, you know, because the love of God casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. And so the only fear we should have, really, that's going to be righteous is going to be the fear of God, mm -hmm. which is the beginning. Then we begin to sit and think, well, God is in control. And there, there we go right back again. We are in trouble because men have lost the, the, the fear of God. It, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And there's plenty of fools out there. Mm -hmm. And they're saying there is no God. And But that should not cause us to have fear because we're part of the virtuous woman. We're the bride of Christ. All of us, they belong within the church. So back to the subject of, you know, the the, the scarlet, uh, clothed with scarlet, what kind of robe or what kind of covering do we have? Which, uh, you know, you sit and think about it, a, what is it called? I guess it's a, is it an oxymoron, I guess. That how can blood, as we look at it, how can blood wash us as white as snow? Make us clean as white as snow, as in Isaiah. How can it do that? Apparently it can't. But it does. Spiritually it does, but carnally it does. But carnally it can't, like you say. It doesn't. I mean, you get, you know, if you get blood stain as natural on it, it's almost, uh, sometimes you just have to throw the garment away. Mm -hmm. You know. But you know, that scarlet is the color of the blood. It is the blood that is applied. Mm -hmm. And if I have that on my, my on, you know, the church, I'm not worried about the things to come as long as I can stay in the blood. Because we know what's coming. He's done prepared us. And he's telling John there on the old pattern, these things will shortly come to pass. Mm -hmm. I think he had, but it also comes to pass just like Solomon and Gomorrah. You know, give me 50 that 50 good men, I'll save the whole city. Five, ten, give me one, the Lord will save the whole city. And they look, and the one, except for a lot that comes out in his wife, and she looks back, the heart drew her back into the Egypt, into the world, and yeah. trash sucked her back down and that blood that is there that he's in, in and he was he was in the winter yeah because he was battling with it he was fighting and struggling and the, the seed cycle was in the winter because they they didn't care what was happening they didn't care their coldness was there and they did not have like you said the fear of god because we're living this and that we know more than god does and you hear it now you know i got more money than god has Heard that just recently. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and hey, you know, people get handled. Yeah. And he does not care. And I mean, what the Lord put on me when, when Christ goes in there and he plants that cord, that's the word. He's going in there, buddy. He's handling it. Is. Yeah. He's telling them, y'all don't know what you're doing. This is the house of God. 
and the word will flip you like a like a switch that you don't yeah, have you on the chest has it. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is exactly what you said, the chest has it. To, to get you back where you need to be. Does that help any? So, you know, she's not afraid because all her household are clothed with scarlet. So that's that's where we need to look. In other words, she's looking after her children. Okay? Th this assembly needs to look after her children. Okay? And so when we look after her, you know, to see that her household, because it, it has to be the household of faith. If we see those that are moving away and slipping away from how we are to do everything, it doesn't mean that they're not going to leave. Okay? But what you have to, you're going to try to have to do everything that we can Okay, and, with, and, and God, we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that we have to do everything. And does, does people go past Christ or go past the blood? Yes, they do. Yeah. They will go past that. We, we as a nation, I feel, are moving past the, what would I say, the blessings, the overshadowing of God, I think we are moving swiftly past the blood, the covering that's there. You know, you say, well, you know, he covered a whole nation all of the nation of the United States to be saved. That's not what I'm saying. Before somebody gets it twisted, you know, might be listening. Uh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there, because there are saints of God. It's sort of like this. Sometimes I know in my own life, because of my parents and the way they lived and places they did not go and places that they did go and how they lived, it helped overshadow me. It helped keep me out of trouble. Okay, because number one is because they was teaching me what is righteous and the way to go. Were they always right? Just same as I'm not always right. Same as you're not always right. But we're doing, and God looks and sees that we're doing the best that we can. And that's where we grow in grace. And sometimes we find out a little bit too late and say, I wish I'd have done that, you know. But God knows, and that's why he's long-suffering with us. And that's why he is, is us as a family, us as churches, and us as a nation. God looks and sees that we have made a lot of mistakes. But, but the main thing is that there are praying people. And, and I think the only reason why God still hasn't, is not appeared with the, you know, with his son is because there's praying people. Long suffering. And he's long suffering. That's exactly right. So, and what keeps us, what helps us to, you know, to not have that fear of the cold. She's not afraid of the cold. Because we look and we say, well, if God should come tomorrow, we don't have the fear. He's cast out that fear. Because and it's very possible he could appear tomorrow, and it, and if we die, and he you know this thing goes on and other people go on without us, if we die, we're still we're coming to judgment. The instant you die, you go to judgment. Mm -hmm. Now I know there's a lot of disagreement in in that particular way, but he said, you know, it's once appointed unto men to die, and after this. The judgment. I know people saying judgment's way out there. When you die, you're not just laying down there in the dirt. I know we've talked about the resurrection and it all goes into that and it ties right into it. But once you die, you're not just there in the dirt. That body, it will decay and go back. I don't care where they put you in a crematory. I don't care where they stick you in a sepulcher, bury you in the ground. I don't care what they do to you, to this body. It, it's not going to heaven or hell. The soul and the spirit is who is what's going back to God who judges. And if we have not, or we go back to the scarlet covering, the blood, and the garment that we have on. When we come to judgment and Christ looks at us and says, Friend, why do you not have on the garment? He called them friend. Why don't you have on the wedding garment? Because you're part of the bride. And if we don't have on the wedding garment, we're not part of his bride then, right? So then, you know, but if when judgment comes and we stand before him, the Stephen says we're covered by that blood. And he looks and God sees the blood of who? Of his son. It's the spiritual implication. It's the look and 
that God's going to look and know that your soul and spirit has accepted what his son did because the father that sent him wanted him to and he obeyed what the father said for him to do. And he came in the form of sinful flesh, in that form, but not, he was like us, but not like us. He was different from us. He had on the, that same, uh, you know, different, that in his flesh, there was no sin. In ours, there is. Because he was God, had all power, both in heaven and earth, because God the Father gave it to him. Because the Word was with the Father all the times in the past, but then it was made flesh and dwelt among men. So we then, as the virtuous woman, the church, we don't have to be afraid of the snow. That's what she says. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. And those that come, and that's what we need to project forth, those that come on Sundays or whenever we meet or in our family meetings or ever what is revivals or funerals or whatever, we're not afraid of the snow. People say, oh, all the terrible things going on. I'm not saying it's wrong to talk about the things that's going on in the world. That's okay. You know, sometimes that needs to strengthen us and help strengthen our faith that we know that things are getting bad. And I think they'll get, you know, and I, I, I preached a message maybe a few months ago and mentioned part of it that you're starting to hear people say uh, to, to the effect even so come, Lord Jesus. It's getting bad. It's getting bad. And th because we realize that we have our children, our children's having children, and their children's going to have children. And if God, you know, he, you know, he said, if, if he doesn't cut it short, no flesh would be saved. Okay? This thing is getting so bad that if he doesn't cut this, make a short work of this thing, you know, when we look and see that we may be gone, but our children's children or our children's children's children, that none of them would be saved. And, you know, and you know, you look and say, well, I would, to the point, I don't want nobody to go to hell. As Job said, it would have been better that I would not have been born. It would be better for them not to have been born than to come into this world that is so ungodly, such a heathen place, that which heathen means away from God. And it would be so bad you know, for them that there would be practically to the point of no hope because of the teachings and stuff that goes on that it does not uh, go with what God wants to be established that it's doing by his son. And it's, it's like I preach and try to preach every day that nobody ever will or anything to come will ever be saved without Jesus Christ. Noah did not get saved without Christ. He did not have grace without Christ. Moses knew Christ. Abraham knew Christ. And all those patriarchs of old that was with God knew Christ. There's no way to the Father. No man can come to the Father except through and by him. So that's like the uh, harlot, you know, uh, give me the name. Rahab, Rahab the harlot, a bad with names. Rahab the harlot, she let down that scarlet thread to help the spies and so on to, to escape and stuff like that. Yeah, for the because then salvation had come to her house. She wounded. Here's one that you don't hear on me try to explain that she wounded the dragon, which is also called Satan, that old devil. What was the other? I always say, well, you know, I try to get the people stinky. Was there a dragon flying around the wall? <laughs> was there real dragons, you know? And she wounded that dragon? No, we know it is spiritual. People will accept it as a spiritual thing, but they don't really understand that she defeated her sins through the scarlet line through Christ. She overcame her sins through Christ, even though she was a harlot. And said that her whole that that her and her has many that would come in, and I'm sure there was some kin people to her that perished in the wall, that did not come, 
but as many come into her household. That's sort of like in the our assembly here. There you go. Assembly here, that as many that will come into this house, many has done and went on. They're gone. And those that's left now and whatever future it might be, but with it, that comes into that household shall be saved, but only through Christ. The rest of them perished when the walls fell. It perished when they went in and invaded. They, you know, uh, so it was. It's just like the coming of the Lord. Well, the death angel went through Egypt if you're in the house with the blood applied. Mm -hmm. Do a little on the doorpost. Yeah. Do not come out. If you're in the house, you're all right. If you come out, you're dead. Mm -hmm. If you stay within the veil, the blood under the stain of the Christ, you're okay. But once you step outside that door that is there, that you can open, you can feel that. You go out the door. Yeah. You can go out. Come in. You're free in righteousness, and you're free in unrighteousness. You do whatever you want to do. That's because uh, in our modern terms, you know, I heard it like this, you know, as a, uh, I said somewhere, it might have been here or down at uh, Philadelphia a couple Sundays ago, but you hear uh, things now, how they're beginning to explain uh, things that they, uh, especially prophecy preachers, how that they're trying to explain modern times is because that our forefathers, uh, you know, did not understand and did not know. I don't believe that. I, be I believe that uh, the old patriarchs and stuff, Abraham and them, knew, probably understood a whole lot more than James Moore does. I'll put it that way. You know, and, and Paul and them. And so, you know, they were talking about all of these uh, things of the mark of the beast and how that every eye was going to see him. They understood how, how every eye was going to see him. They didn't have to have the knowledge of the internet or television. But all oh, they explained that. Well, the, now we know. This is what one said. Now we can know. Our, finally, we have figured it out. We now know how that every eye shall behold him. Because we've got the internet. Well, what if you don't want it? What if the television's on the blink? Like mine right now. Hmm? I can't get Channel 5. So because they want the country, so the nations don't have internet. Yeah. Some of them don't, yeah. Some places here. So, you know, and even if you said, well, it was because, you know, every eye's going to be, but there's tribes off in the jungle still yet. You know, and I know that a lot of them, they've got internet. They show that they have satellite and all that. But that's not what, you know, he's, he's talking spiritually. Everybody's, you know, every knee shall bow. Well, the body ain't going to be there. It's a spiritual bowing. Mm -hmm. Every knee, you ain't, ain't going to be on knees. So think about that. Now, may God, God may give us one in the fashion of the form of the body, the new body that he gives us. But he said, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, I just tell him he, he, you want to do it. That's yeah. what he's saying. Individual. Everybody Individual. Just want to do it. Just yeah. You know that he, he is there. You want to know who he is. There's not going to be any doubt. No doubt at all that he's there. You want to say that he mentioned you want to damnation or amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. So it's good to know that, that <clears throat> she's not afraid of the snow, yeah. the wintertime, her household, and her clothes with scarlet. Okay. She maketh herself coverings of tapestries, of of uh, fine work, yeah. you know, of things. Her clothing is silk and purple. Um, you know, silk still yet today is a costly array. Okay. So then you look at the purple. Now, you know, the uh, song, there's a one bit, I ain't heard it in a long time. Yeah, scarlet purple robe. Mean dress. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it used to be sung quite often in churches. You don't hear it anymore, but the man who wore the scarlet purple robe. And, you know, it, all of these things have their their meanings, which is of richness, it's of royalty, you know, and, and in it. And uh, so, but look what, what God 
clothes his bride with. It's white, pure white linen, but she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. It's of uh, a fine artwork, I guess you would say. It is a thing that where people can be able to want and to see. Okay? So, I know we could look at it and say, well, you, you know, we got to be dressed, and I, I know a lot of people say preachers ought to wear a certain kind of clothes this way and that way. Well, who gives me the authority or you the authority to say a preacher's got to wear a necktie when neckties has only been invented in the what? I don't know how far back, 100, maybe 200 years ago. I don't know. But it used to not be a fashion. And now a necktie makes it to where you're a preacher. I mean, if that makes the preacher, a suit of clothes makes the preacher. You know, what if he, what if he's poor, you know, on it and he, and he can't afford a suit of clothes? You know, you look at old Elijah and some of them, you know, well, let's look at John the Baptist. Camel hair. Boy, he was a fine preacher of God. Clothes of camel hair. You know, and, and stuff. So, you know, if you take that, you can also look into some spiritual things of what he was wearing and stuff like that too. Uh, on it. But uh, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. So let's look at our church or to look at us and view us of the tapestry. You know, it's not something that people's got to say weave something and let's make a, a, a quilt or a tapestry, you know, a wall hanging or or a table thing spread that everybody's got to look to see what our wealth is or our beauty is or anything like that. That's all well and good if you've got ornamental things around that, that's pleasing to us. But what should be is the tapestry. What is, what does people, in other words, if a stranger walked in here tonight, what is our tapestry that we're trying to present and to show? In our teachings tonight, love and love of God. right? <clears throat> and so she, you know, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. It's it is it is beautiful. It's in other words, it, it's more beautiful than any fine needlework that anybody could do. And some of it's beautiful. I mean, certain cultures and stuff's got some fine things, but it's more than that. It is what we portray ourselves to those that would come in and to our other um, brothers and sisters that may be visitors that would come that are Christians also how that we show the love of you know that she make her, herself coverings of tapestry her clothing is silk and purple and people are to see what what are, what are they seeing in us it's some tapestries had a story behind it. Tells a tale. And when you see it, you know the story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back in history with the castles, people would come in and see the tapestry. You know which Ideology. clan you belong to. Yeah. And so it's That's like a good one, yeah. they could come in, anybody could come in and visit, see the tapestry of this church and know you belong to God. Yeah. What that's the teachings your, are, and that's story. the story you're telling. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this take for the instance the American Indian. You know, yeah, they had their own separate languages and told the tale, but a lot of it they had it in a belt type thing that they passed on from generation to generation and had their stories on their teepees and and their buffalo skins and all that telling of great hunts and all these things and you know of, of, of stories you know that a lot of people on the outside did not know and the only way is unless somebody told them this is the time of a great winter and this is when you know bravery of so and so done this and done that well you look at how that we present do we have to give a um belt or a TP or like I said a tapestry a big piece of cloth hanging on the wall saying you know of this this is what the, the tale of that well there's nothing wrong if you want to weave one until from the time of creation till till 
you know, the crucifixion, if you want to show the story and so like that, it's good if you want to hang it on the wall. You, so you might be able to use it as a teaching tool for kids and this and that and that. I'm not saying those things are wrong. What I'm saying is, but it ought to be something that is not tangible. That thing could get burned up in the fire. Yeah. But you know, it's just like when I'm shot, when we shot Benadryl's in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar would. You know, well, I'm like you. Sometimes, uh, I know one time when I was, uh, uh, first got back with the Lord, and God was wanting me to preach. And uh, you kind of wrestling within yourself. I, you know, I mean, it's one of those things. I know people say, well, only preachers know, but I think everybody knows. God's got something for everybody to do. You know, and you wrestle in yourself. And, you know, with me, uh, you know, I, I was, I'm a painter. And one day I was fiddling with a, a paint gun and was going to paint on, a, I believe it was on one of Rick Mullins' ambulances, I believe. <laughs> and that paint gun wasn't acting right. And I, you know, I had, my own thoughts was a going and I was doing this and I got so mad, I threw that paint gun from one end of the shop to the other. Wasn't nothing wrong with that paint gun. It's all with me. You know, the paint gun probably could have used a good cleaning somehow, but it was relatively a new paint gun. <laughs> and my partners and stuff there looked at me, and, and uh, I had come to apologize. You know, I had to apologize for the anger that I had. And it was within me because, you know, I, I was trying to resist a lot of things that, you know, God wanted me to be doing. And then there's other times that I, you know, I, I know there's a time as a, as a teacher that students got, you know, you told them over and over and over, and, and, and I mean, and not just one, but I mean, it seemed like half or three quarters of the class was, I mean, just going against everything that was there. And, but it, you know, and I cut loose on them, you know, and finally I pulled them all together. I suppose I'm going to apologize. And they said, no, you're justified. I suppose don't give me the justification. I said, yeah, you was doing wrong, but I'm not justified in being that angry. You know, you cannot, you, in other words, it's sort of like, I guess, I said last time we was here, that our forefathers, we could look back and say, why did not my former Bible study teacher, pastor, right on and on and on back before, and the different places. Why did they not teach me? Well, our first thing is that we blame those. And they are to blame, but not to me. I mean, it's not for me to blame. God's going to hold them accountable. Just as he's going to hold me accountable. So there's no need for me, you know, to look and say, well, this, I should have been looking into the Word of God myself. Okay? I should have been looking into it myself. So, you know, yeah, it is it that those should be doing? It's like us. We should be doing what we're doing now is trying to find out the depth. Yeah, you know, the deep things, yea, the deep things of God. And they're beyond finding out. If you think you're going, you know, we say, well, we'll come up here and we'll meet so many times and we'll figure this whole thing out. We'll go verse by verse from, from Genesis 1 to the last amen in Revelation. And when we get through with this thing, we'll know it all. And then you could start all over again and God will reveal more and more and more to you. That's why I always tell people in the notes and stuff that I give, they're not, they're, they're not, you know, exhaustive by no means. You know, they're just only there usually to remind me. And it usually reminds me of something different every time I study. Okay? So, you know, she she we should be able to show us what said we ought to be able to show the love and our 
Our story should be told of what when people come in, whether they're from another church or whether, you know, whether they're professed Christians or they're not. They ought to be able to see that story, that tapestry, that fine artwork that God has worked with us. And our story should be there. You love the Lord. As David said in Psalms 116, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. For he has saved my soul from hell, kept my feet from falling, you know, and uh, so, and, and you know, he's, he, he kept us from death, our soul from death, and he he helps us to keep from falling away and kept my eyes from tears. You know, just like in, in your anger, you do things, say things, and I do too. And I said, God, right, but also in fear, just like that, she's not afraid because sometimes we'll seek shelter in something that we shouldn't be seeking shelter in to help us with the fear. Because, you know, you get afraid sometimes you run to the wrong thing to protect you falling right into the trap. You know, it doesn't look like it. But, you know, it's still dark because he tells us, you know, both are blind, both are going to fall into the ditch. And that protection that is there is not protection. It's just a false, uh, what do you want to say? A facade that's our cover. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just, just, yeah. just yeah. something that both you fall in and it, it collapses on you. Yeah, you can go back. I know we, we started out this was looking at a comparison between the church, the false church, and this one. And you go back into Proverbs, other ones, I think four and seven and so on like that. And there's 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 other assemblies out there that will beckon you to come in and not realize that 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 she, you know she calls out you know and to the to the simple to through the casement through the window and says, won't you come? Won't you come to my church? Won't you come over here to my gathering? We believe in God. There's many religions that will tell you we, matter of fact, almost all religions except the Church of Satan, I guess, or whatever, will believe in God. Yep. And to them, you know, they, they think it's a, a figure and they worship a whatever, and that is their God. But anyways, you look at it, they, they, they want you to come to theirs not knowing, as it says, that that her steps lead down to hell. But we're taking in this. She says, come, let us take our loves till morning. You know? And let us enjoy, you know, people. And they enjoy it. There's pleasure in sin. There's all those scriptures are there. There's pleasure in sin, but only for a season. But this is what we've got with God's for all eternity. It's the love that that that's beyond anything else. That salvation is a love beyond anything else and it is a story it is a tapestry it is a clothing it is something that that they ought to be able to see the blood cover it's sort of like I've preached long before and I've preached in last Sunday or two that we do not have uh, in other words a bucket of blood when people get saved and we, we've got to make sure they're covered in the blood and we pour it over their head or even you know, and I know people do some kind of rituals sometimes in some churches, and, and they'll do this and stuff like that, and touch their forehead and so on like that of stuff. But it is it is a spiritual covering of the blood that was shed for us over two thousand years ago, and it's His blood. That one drop of blood covers the whole earth. He covers everything, and so we accept that, and God sees that. It is by faith we believe in that it is by faith we believe that our feet are clean it is by faith that we believe that we are eating of the flesh of Christ and drinking the blood of Christ it is by faith it is by the the spirit that we looking and we're seeing that we know that our feet's clean enough and even if we ain't got no feet even if we've been blown off cut off or born without them we still got feet and we can still carry, blessed are the feet, I believe I read that sentence, blessed are the feet of them that, that carry the gospel of good tidings. So, you know, we can still carry that word of God. And that people look and see that, that we're clothed with that scarlet. 
and and that uh, per, uh, clothing is silk and purple. Anything else on that? We'll catch this next one. Her husband is known in the gates. So who's her husband? First of all, who's her husband? Christ. Christ is her husband. Now, who is she? We first got to establish who is she, okay? Her, who is this her? Her, and as David said, his soul, uh, she doth magnify the Lord. We're talking about a man, David. But he said, he's talking about his soul. She doth magnify the Lord. His soul. Because he calls her a she. So we look and we see because David realized he was a part of the bride mm -hmm. of Christ. I know there's a lot, you know, a lot of people say, you know, especially in the male gender, say, you're not going to call me no woman. But if you don't want to be called a part of the bride of Christ, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> I really do. I feel sorry for you. That if that's all you can think of is of the, the carnality of things, uh, of that, and you got. If you don't get past that, you're still you. You can't get past the veil of Moses. You can't look and see Christ. You're not seeing. It. All right. Her husband, the church. Now, now, if you open up the books of this assembly, you'll find male and female on the books as far as the natural books that are here. And if you open up when he tells Malachi, when the books are open and everything is read, you'll find. That there'll, there'll be people there that's going to be like, uh, uh, you know, all those uh, Dorcas and Rhoda and, uh, you know, the woman at the well, unnamed. There's going to be all kinds of females in that, that things, and there's going to be all kinds of males in that great book. As far as what we would know them as now, if you looked at them in the natural. But in the kingdom of God, there is neither male nor female nor Scythian nor barbarian. There's neither Jew nor Greek. It's all become one in Christ Jesus. So her husband, uh, so we look at it as if we're a part, even in this assembly, you know, where we're at here or wherever you go and is your place of, uh, which you, you know, we talk, we home church or whatever it might be on it, a place of worship or assembly. But her husband is known in the gates. We are to let people know when they first come in that Jesus Christ is the main topic and the thing that we're talking about. It is Christ. And her husband is known in the gates. And this, he should say, well down there at Martintown, if you go down there, all you'll hear is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That ought to be the Amen. most blessed thing that they could say about you. Right. If you go to work, wherever, Jesus Christ is what you is all that you hear, and that's what it's all about. I don't care if you go to the, in the beginning, the Word was there; He created everything. You go up to the end; it's still Jesus Christ. It's it's still Jesus right here in Proverbs thirty-one, and He's trying to show us His pride that how that He takes we've become bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. So, and you, you could even break that on down. What about the leadership? What about your pastors, your evangelists, your deacons? The husband, you know, that's, uh, that's sort of like the qualifications, you know, be the husband of one wife. If God puts us in uh, control of a church, you know, to be a leader of it, and to have uh, uh, to establish the government and the leadership and the teachings and all those things uh, as it then that's what's going you're going to have to be the husband of one wife it should be the virtuous woman it should be one that preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified and and you you know if it's not number one that's like my wife Kathy is number one speaking carnally naturally is number one in my life She's number one above everything else. She's above my children. Above my children. Okay? So, the, the, but, the, but the other thing that's greater than her is God. It becomes God first, then my family. Speaking of Kathy, and then, then my children. All right? So, you know, my children, 
may disagree and leave and uh, not have any association with you anymore. But, you know, that's their choices. Just like, you know, and a lot of people's wives do. You know what I'm saying? In, in the natural. But the the but if it's talking about love, if we truly got love, I always say it like this. If you've got a Christian woman and a Christian man, there should not be anything that they could not work out. If there's something you cannot work out, one of them or both of them's got a problem with God. Yeah. One or both's got a problem with God. If we're talking on the Christian level, one or both's got a problem with God. If they're with God. So her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. So, you know, we ought to be able, somebody come along and say of our deacons, our evangelists, our pastors, of our assemblies, they say, you know, when in the, even in a natural conversation, they say brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so and so on like that, the leaders of the church, that they believe in Christ. That's what the top main subject ought to be. Then they might be, well, they're, they're, they're this or they're that. So it'll, it'll fall far below what Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, you know, you could have somebody that comes every Sunday and preaches every Sunday, but if they don't preach Christ, they could be faithful. They could be loyal. But it's still... We're falling way short if we're not preaching Jesus Christ or teaching Christ. All right. So her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. So look at chapter 12, verse 4, particularly. I'll start at verse 1 while you turn. Pro just go back. Proverbs 12. Turn three or four pages back. So, whoso loveth, as verse 1, whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but by the root of the righteousness shall not be moved. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. She's going to tell about Christ. A virtuous woman. Okay, it's what she is over here. You know, uh, who can find a virtuous woman? A virtuous woman... First of all, an assembly is going to tell about Christ. We are getting him today to where they'll talk about God or they'll say you can have Jesus and, or it's and and Jesus. It is solely Jesus Christ. It is him. If we add anything to it or take away, we're, we're going to fall into judgment for it. We're going to have to give an account for it. But she maketh a, a shame... A, but she that maketh us shamed is as rottenness in his bones. If, if we as assemblies do not um, honor the husband, mainly Jesus Christ, all right, and those that are proclaiming Jesus Christ uh, is as rottenness in his bones. One place, you know, if, if we go, if you really look into it and study it out, you, if we don't have Christ, we're married to Christ. And if we go outside of Christ, we're, we call it in modern, you're stepping out on it. You're committing adultery on, spiritual adultery on Christ. If I have another wife, fine. Yeah. Hope. You are. And so we look and see, I've always asked this question, Did, does, the, does the church... In other words, does the wedding ceremony that we have, uh, you know, do, do we base it on the Bible or do we base the Bible on our ceremony? Ceremony based on the Bible. On the Bible. And so we look and we see the veil and all the things that are there and our vows is there. It's, it's in representation of the church. Okay, in its purity and all that. And so we hope everybody comes to that, even though that there are plenty of lost people goes through the same ceremony. They'll put on the white veil and all that. And we hope that they will come to the understanding. You know, it, it used to be revered as a sacred oath, a vow, 
when and it's made before God. Now today they make it, it's not before God. It's just you just come and say it before whatever, and it's just because of a piece of paper. And if you're not satisfied with each other, well, we give you a space of time, and you come. We'll write you a bill of divorce. So a virtual, virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. When an assembly, a church as we would have it, that preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified, you know, she's, she's a crown buddy, to, to her husband. She reverences him, appreciates him above everything else. Okay? But, these, but she that maketh the shame is as rotten as he's about, to his bones. So when we start believing on something with Christ or outside of Christ or if our devotion is to some other type of um, assembly, doctrine, uh, something that takes our time. Okay? Something that takes our time above that which is of Christ. Now, I know, don't get me wrong. Everybody's got to work. We know, we know that. Everybody's got to work and everybody's got family duties and stuff. Okay? But this is where it comes to is the heart. Where is, and God knows the heart. You know, if, um, I'm trying to say it without uh, being offensive. If there is some other established assembly, meeting place, club, there's a good word. If there is a different club, it can go be under many different things that takes rank over top of worshiping God. We need to find out, bring ourselves, we need to bring it into check. Now, can it override us? Because it does. Because there is people will help lure you into those things. And sometimes we go headlong into those things, like you was talking about a minute ago. We run to that because we uh, there may be other problems and stuff. We run to those things for fellowship and safety. And they, it's, it's sometimes it's not that they're wrong, but it comes wrong to us. It pulls us away. It pulls us away. There may be good people in those things. They do good deeds in those things. But it is not, let's just put it like, it's not church. I don't care if you pray before it. I don't care whatever it is. And you pray before you sit down and have a meal. It's still not the worship of God. And it will pull people away. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. Because there's always something there that will pull you away. So her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. That he, that when it's come when it comes to so how can and I know it's getting late and we'll we're going to stop at this one. But how can we? Um, how can we? Proclaim and show to the people. And what is our purpose of us being here tonight? It's so that we can learn all these things, how that we might be well equipped, how we can be stronger in showing forth our husband. And I know we've got a lot of perversion in the land. And everybody's a husband anymore. I don't care what it is. Just about one way or another of some time. But, you know, and they want to use, try to use certain things to twist the word of God to say they're just as justified <clears throat> as we are. Well, if you believe that, you live that, you live that, if you can get that through God and through his things, which you're not going to. I believe with all my heart, or otherwise I wouldn't preach against it, but that's between, and if you think you're going to go to heaven by living a perverse life, you're deceived. It's deceit. Somebody's deceived you. 
if nothing that's your own self. You've been you're deceived and you're you're deceiving and being deceived. And you know, most of the time it is yourself. It is. I, I deceived myself because just like I ran for that safety in numbers to be okay with us because we have numbers, but it's not. And every time you hear you see that the Lord talks about wicked, it's deceit and it's problems and trials and darkness and the, the husband of one wife. I can you be you be pastor over this church and pastor over that church over there, but it's still still the same husband, it's still Jesus Christ. He's not talking about being able to run run to church, you know. He's talking about one in Jesus Christ and one over here of the world of the wickedness or the false teaching or whatever. Then that's when you commit adultery against God, spiritual conduct or spiritual adultery. If a, this church here one and over at Dang, Clinton Wood, wherever it is, if they're of the same bride, they're both preaching, teaching, and, and Jesus Christ crucified, mm -hmm. and nothing else. Yeah. Then we all have the same husband, we're of the same household, and we should be able to go and eat the same supper that's laid before each and every one of us from the Master's table. But lots of times, the food that is on this table is not the food that's on that table over there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when you're doing wrong and you know it, you're going to look justification somewhere and you're going to find somebody that will help you justify that most of the time yeah and, you know Tim you brought up the subject you know like having to been over to church it used to be very popular because it was a necessity and I'm not saying that that was wrong I'm just saying but if you've got let's say you've got a church of two or three hundred members and you're trying to take care of that and you've got another church over here that's Another hundred or yeah. whatever, yeah. and you know, you're you're bringing on yourself uh, a thing, I guess. Yeah, and because one because one wants more devoted of time. Correct. Just sit and think about it of uh, being married to women. One's more, more attention, the other, right. and how you know on it, and that's why. God doesn't want us to have that in our natural lives. Right. And I think even in our spiritual life, I'm not saying that you can't help out. Right. So like that, that you can. But eventually you're going to have to, this is going to be your main wife. This right. is your wife. Right. Because David, you look at David, who was, uh, had uh, many wives. Solomon. Concubines. But Solomon's a different story. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> David, David had many <laughs> churches. He was over. Right. Okay. You know, he had many churches he was over, and those type of things. And and I think that, that it, it take, would take. It's like Apostle Paul said, "I know how to uh, uh, lead a, about a wife and a sister." He knew both. He knew how to pastor and to evangelize. Correct. You know, because it's a sister church. Right. Somebody else was over. It was her, their husband. Okay. Uh, which is not speaking that, that they had another besides Jesus Christ. They all have to have Christ. Right. But the pastor of the church is also called the husband. The husband of the church. Right. Because you're in the place of who? Christ. God is over man. I mean, God is over Christ. Christ is over man. The man is over woman. Is that right? That assembly, whatever. But God is over all. And you're the representation of Christ. Just you're, you're the represent. You're in the stead of. You're in the place of. You're the shepherd. We call them different things. We call them pastors, shepherds, elders, bishop. Well, bishops a little different, but they are. But it's all included in. A bishop is when you're able to be give answers to a lot of pastors. You know, I think we take that out of context. The bishop, if you desire the office of a bishop, you desire the good work. And we do that for the thing of ordaining preachers Indeed. and deacons. But that bishop is a higher order. In other words, like you've got a conference that this church and this church and this church and this church, and they all come together. He is able to tell, give advice to those other preachers, deacons, and so on. And that's part of the government. Mm -hmm. But we take that as, as the ordination. And the deacons also must be the husband of one wife and so on. Not given to strong drink. 
all this mm-hmm. stuff. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> as we get back, <laughs> 20, 23 is where we'll stop at. Anything else to that? <laughs> all right. You want to pick it up? Any more on that or on 24?